Welcome to the Fort Wayne Museum of Art's Masterpiece Series. I'm Charles Shepard, and I'm the president of the museum, and I'm here in our new glass wing in one of the galleries to bring you a special masterpiece for today. Before we look at the work, though, let's just spend a minute to think about what it takes to get a masterpiece, and that takes mastery. And mastery in the glass world is about 10,000 hours of training that's pretty much five years of solid training to get to become a master in your particular approach to glass and start producing masterpieces. We're going to look at Richard Ritter's wonderful piece here, Untitled, but there's a lot going on in this untitled piece. Now Richard, unlike some of the glass artists we talked about in earlier programs of the series, this is a blown glass piece, so this has a tr very traditional start. And I think some of you are going to say, well, I, I thought they all looked like vases and they were all hollow or lightweight and that looks heavy. Well, it is very heavy. It is very solid, but it's still f coming from the blown glass method and those procedures to get to the piece that we have today. Now, we have to think about what Richard was facing in a situation of creating a piece like this, even at this size, which is roughly the size of a soccer ball, we're looking at about 58 pounds of glass. Now he's going to start with a steel blowpipe. Blowpipe is going to be about six feet long. They can go up to eight feet long. It's going to be hollow so that you can blow air in. Richard's going to take that blowpipe and dip it into one of the furnaces which holds a crucible of molten borosilicate glass. That's the standard glass for blowing. And he is going to get a gather of that, which is exactly what it sounds like. He'll take his steel rod with his gloves on, probably, for the heat, and he's going to twist it until he has a nice chunk of glass, honey in consistency and dripping. He'll pull it out. It starts to cool immediately. That makes the potential for drips less, although you'll notice he'll going to dip that down. There's a steel bucket below, and he's going to get the last fluid glass off that little sphere, which is going to be about the size of a baseball at this point. And it's clear, and he's going to be turning this because if he doesn't keep turning the steel rod, and if you can imagine holding three or four pound blob of glass at the end of six feet and constantly turning, you've got to turn it so it stays an orb and doesn't get misshapen. He's then going to come over to a, a table, a steel table called a marving table. And the marving table is not hot, but it's not cold enough to shock the glass. And he's going to roll that gather around and around on the marver table and He's looking to get any bubbles out. He's looking to keep the shape. He's cooling it off just a little bit. And from that very modest start, he's going to start doing some amazing things to that original blob. Now, if he wants a pattern, if he wants any kind of color, color he's going to need to add minerals to some of the glass, and that will give the color. Like cadmium is going to get you to blue. Cobalt will get you to blue. And he's a specialist in a thing called marini, Italian word. And marini consists of thin pieces, probably the width of a pencil, of glass. And to get Marini to that point, he's going to go get his gallery assistant, his head gaffer, and they're going to go, while they park the first ball, they're going to park it in, in a heated garage, so to speak. They're going to get another steel rod and get another glob of glass going, bring it out. His gaffer's going to come across 
and he'll have a steel rod or she'll have a steel rod as well, and they'll both have their steel rod punched into that almost liquid glob of glass. And they're going to start spinning that. And the gaffer and artist will walk away from each other, backing up sometimes as many as 20 feet, pulling a rope of glass between them that's ever thinner. As they pull back, when they think they're at the right length for the right thickness of that piece of cane, is what they call it, C-A-N-E, they will go closer to the floor, on the floor. They have a special wooden cradle made. And when that glass is thin enough and cool enough, not cold, but cool, they will lay that on that long plank wise. It will cool off so that they can work with it. Now working with Marini means you're going to put it on the bench and chop it in six or eight inch sections. Then you might have some red, you might have some pink, you might have some blue or purple. I see some yellow in here. The basic way you're going to do is you're going to take a warmed ceramic, almost like a cutting board, and you're going to lay your rods out in whatever pattern you'd like to be able to pick up. Now, a basic pattern would be your color choices in the order that you want them. And because that pad, that cutting board, so to speak, is warm, you're trying to get them to stick together a little bit, a little stickiness around the edge. You might grab your torch and heat them up a bit. A lot of glass work is done outside the oven with torches providing the flame. Then you've got a pattern laid out. You get another blob of glass at the end of your six foot pole, and it has to be measured with calipers so that its, its circumference is exactly the distance of the laid out marini. You will lay that on the marini at the right moment and twist, and you'll roll that marini up onto your glass ball and put it in the oven. You want it to join in the oven. You're going to pull it out every minute or two and use a steel shaper to make sure they're sticking in the right spots. You leave it another few minutes and bring it out. You put it on the marbling table and you'll roll that glass over and over because now it's going to change from a ball to a cylinder. You can extend that cylinder and make further later cuts in it or you could start adding things. Now, Richard loves to add things in. The latissimo, which is like lattice, he will have laid that out on a similar ceramic block and made a lattice pattern. In this case, he's got some blues and whites in there. And he wants it to be very, very thin because he wants to be able to increase the size of his original gather with another bit of glass on it and then he'll roll on to that ceramic slab and pick up just the gather and manipulate it with both the marbling table surface and some wooden tools until it doesn't spread all the way around his form but instead it starts torquing to the left and right and creates a shape within that. He can also go back to the marbury table and bring some individual pieces of marini in here besides the latticino and pull them through as though they were thin air or liquid, which at this point, of course, in the making, they are liquid. But to keep the glass a certain amount of heat so that it can be malleable, but also can hold together is the biggest trick glass artists have to master. So in this form, each time he goes in to pick up some more color, some more bands of pattern, some more latticino, this ball is getting bigger and bigger 
and heavier and heavier with layers. At the point where we're almost to this size, the gaffer, or Richard, is holding extended arms, holding about 40-something pounds of molten glass out in front of them. Now, they will move it from the marbling table to a rack that rolls so they can get it back in the flames. But still, all this is carrying. If you've ever thought about getting a quart of milk in your hand, that's not too hard to master. You teach your children to pour a glass of milk from a quart. But if you have to take a gallon of milk in one arm, with one arm, and hold it out, all of a sudden you think you got a lot of weight there. Well, think if you had 40 pounds of glass and you can't let it go. It'd be a disaster. So Richard is gonna work that glass and work that glass and work that glass until this round ball, which it isn't now, but it is at the moment he pauses, he's gotta get that out of the 2100 degree fire into a 900 degree annealing oven. And the purpose of the annealing oven is to allow the glass to cool down so slowly that there's no shock to the glass. It holds together, it cools off very slowly, can take days. A piece this size could take more than a week. Now, right then in the studio, I'm, everybody's applauding Richard. Every gaffer is so happy they got this done, but it's not done yet. He's gonna get this cool down to room temperature. He's gonna wait a couple more days and take it from the annealing oven over to a bench in his cold working part of the shop. And he's gonna use saws and grinders to grind flat spaces onto the circle to give it a whole new geometry. And at the same time, as he does that, he gives us a whole new vision into what's happening inside this glass ball. And it's so exciting to look in and then find there's another facet that you can look in and see another angle on all the stuff he's assembled in the middle. It's a gorgeous piece. Richard is a master. And this certainly untitled piece from the Triolet series is a masterpiece in glass.